that Sheriff's Conference this week and we're not able to be here tonight. Uh, thank you to all of you for attending here tonight. Uh, the fact that you are here shows your collective community conscious and concern to learn more about a, a topic that we really wish we didn't have to talk about. Um, the Sheriff told me to be here tonight. I was, a little, I was a little apprehensive, um, but at the same time, uh, I was, the first thing that popped to my mind was the memory uh, many, many years ago, and then I, I had never forgotten about it, and I'm going to take you back almost three generations. I'm going to tell this story very, very quickly. Uh, back in the week of uh, Thanksgiving, 1986, uh, some of you may remember, uh, we had a manhunt in Eddyville, North Carolina, for a gentleman by the name of Michael Shornoff. Uh, Michael Shornoff was a uh, notorious bank robber. Uh, during that three or four day endeavor, uh, we had several law enforcement officers shot, and, and Mr. Shornoff ultimately was killed in a, in a shootout on the last day of that event. Now, I tell that story to tell you that a very small community church on the top of the Mountains, uh, called the Mountain Home Baptist Church, opened its doors to us. Um, all of the tactical teams slept in that church, uh, slept in their classrooms for three three days and three nights, doing 24-hour rotating uh, shifts in and out of that church. We had what was called an interperimeter man um, that was established inside of that church. And I've always, uh, now in my 33rd year, and law enforcement, I always remember that church. Now I'm going to take you to the Easter Sunday directly following that when a man by the name of Michael Rainey, who was involved in a domestic dispute with his ex in laws, um, decided to walk into that church. He lived, lived literally across the road from it. Um, they were having an Easter Sunday funeral and decided to walk into that church and open fire in that church, trying to kill his ex-family. Uh, in the process, he critically wounded three people. He killed three other people. Um, many of you may not remember that. Some of you are way too young to even know that we have sustained that type of house of worship violence in Western North Carolina, and especially in the county right beside us. So to think, to have that mindset that it may never ever happen to us is literally sticking your head in the sand. Uh, now the fact of the matter is we may never have a racial incident, we may never have a um, purely religious based in incident in Buncombe County, but, it is, but we don't know the situations out there from a domestic standpoint that we have fired an individual and they live near our church and decides and who decide he or she decides to target us individually because they know that's where we are going to be at that particular time. And those are very much as much of a priority and much of a threat as all of the headlines that are um, attacking us today. And of course some of you may not remember that and even though CNN had been around for eight years at that time, uh, the internet was fledgling at, the best, at best at that time, and uh, the internet was really not even known about for most of us uh, at that point. So the information flow was still not even a fraction of what it is today. Uh, and I can imagine the coverage that that incident would have gotten today. Uh, and not to mention the seven lives, including uh, the shooters in that incident, that all were devastated over the course of about five minutes. Uh, but with that being said, I kind of wanted, I felt obligated to kind of set the tone, set the mood, and, and remind everybody that this can happen in our backyard. It has happened in our backyard. Um, and wanted to, again, thank you for your attendance here tonight. Uh, we hope to pass along a great deal of information that would be helpful to you. I would like to personally, on behalf of the sheriff, I'd like to thank Corporal Ben Parker for coordinating this. I'd like to thank Natalie Bailey uh, for coordinating this. And, and of course, Steve Oxner, who is our um, speaker tonight, uh, for taking his time and coming here and presenting this information to you as well. I hope that it is a, a um, uh, information-filled 
at that point tonight and I thank you for coming. And at this time I'd like to have uh, Corporal Ben Parker come up and he's going to uh, introduce our invocation speaker. So, Reverend Dr. Uh, Ray here, L.C. Ray. Come on up, sir. Greetings, my friends across this great county. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we believe that Thou dost watch over us and wisely and lovingly care about each of us. But Master, you also care about all things from the greatest until the least. We find that there is nothing more marvelous under all the realms of revelation than the incarnation of your Son, our Christ. Bless, dear Master, this gathering and all the people that have come. We ask a special blessing upon our sheriff department, our sheriff and his great staff, and especially those that were responsible for putting this informational gathering together. Bless our speaker. God bless each place of worship that have come where all of us can be together and share with others the importance of your love, but also the importance of safety. God bless our county, our city, our state, and specifically our great country, these United States of America. But Master, we are asking your blessings upon mankind and womankind everywhere. Bless as we gather this information so that we can deliver it back to our congregations, synagogues, and places of worship, where that we would be safer, but also we can share the joys and the love that you share with all of us. Let all of us say together, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Appreciate everyone again being here. Uh, it does uh, really speak volumes to us and us as uh, law enforcement and as a uh, community, and we've got to work together, and we thank everyone for being here. We hope that the information you're going to receive today is uh, going to be beneficial for you and, and the people that uh, we serve. Can I get a show of hands of how many pastors we have here uh, or leaders of any kind of House of Worship. Okay. Very good. Um, all across the South Pole. And I'm sure there's, uh, I, I received some calls earlier in the week that there were some that could not make. And uh, but we're going to be providing a link. Uh, it's being videoed uh, just so you uh, all you know and you can uh, help us spread the word on it that uh, it's going to be accessible, I believe, uh, if I understand correctly, through the Sheriff's Office website. Within a few days, is that correct, Natalie? Okay. Uh, I want to thank Natalie for taking. Uh, she, she's uh, shared a lot of expertise with uh, getting this thing done. Here. Um, I want to go ahead and introduce our speaker uh, now. Steve Oxner and I—I uh, I believe we were talking earlier. I believe it's back in 2006 that uh, I transferred. I was on the road and I transferred over to the Crown Prevention. He was with the Crown Prevention Unit. Uh, I believe Sheriff Duncan had just come on with us, and uh, uh, Steve and I started working at Crown Prevention back in 2006, and I'll tell you, time has flown by. It really has. But I asked him, I called him earlier in a, a couple of days ago, and I said, man, 
You better send me a biography about the dogs. I don't want to embarrass you. So I'm glad he did. Yeah, and when I printed it off, it was in such small font. I mean, this. But uh, of course, you know, as most of you know, Steve is a uh, uh, native of uh, Monken County here in Asheville. He is a third generation public servant. Okay, uh, he has 25 years in law enforcement. Uh, including with the Asheville Police Department and the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office. He retired uh, in 2009 from the Sheriff's Office, uh, ranked as a sergeant with the Crime Prevention, Crime Prevention Unit he was a supervisor. Uh, he has advanced law enforcement certificates from North Carolina Training Standards and the North Carolina Sheriff's Standards. Uh, so uh, that's, that's uh, not something that everyone earns. It takes a lot of Hours. He's a graduate of the North Carolina Administrative Officers Management Program. He's an ordained Southern Baptist minister back in 2008, and uh, where he, he attended Fruitland Baptist Bible Institute. He's been married for 18 years, and he's a father of two. But now they foster uh, with the Bear Foundation, providing care for therapeutic children. And how many do you have now? Eight, nine, nine kids. So I tell you, his his service to the community just doesn't stop. You know, he's he's, he's really serving everyone he can. And also, and and uh, now he may do it. He's not shy. Now he's a baritone singer with a uh, group called uh, Forever Is Four Times. And some of you folks may have uh, heard before. So, all right. Uh, I want you guys to give. Uh, uh, Stephen Warren, welcome here. Uh, and now, when these, if you will, hold your questions until after the presentation, and you're going to have an officer in each aisle, and uh, we will take questions. You know, you can make your way out to the end of the aisle and ask questions that way everyone can hear a whole lot better, okay? That sounds good. The restrooms, if you go out, they're going to be to uh, your right. Um, and uh, there's uh, the water fountain over here I discovered earlier does not work. So if you go through the middle doors directly behind you, follow that all the way down, there's vending machines, and uh, uh, I think only one of those work. Okay. <laughs> and one of those is about half out. So, uh, but anyway, that's okay. If you need to take a break, plenty of chairs. I hope everyone's comfortable in here. We've, we've checked with the, the air and everything, and I believe it's about as low as it's going to Okay? All right. Well, without further ado, uh, let's uh, give Steve a warm up. First time we've gotten to teach this program here, we've taught this one and they have taken it over uh, in several different places all around our county. But this is by far the largest uh, turnout that we've had, and uh, we're definitely thrilled to get to be here. It's an honor for me to get to be able to stand here in this place, especially whenever I consider that uh, a lot of the men who had trained me and taught me everything that I knew, not that they taught me everything they knew, but taught me everything that I knew. Uh, I was very grateful to get me here in this spot, so I want to thank each one of you for coming. Uh, I, I've been working ever since I retired as a, uh, a funeral director associate for a funeral home, and I, I, I found out that one of the things I have to do is I have to make sure I turn myself on. If I don't, I wind up doing the same thing as one of the preachers did one day when he came in to preach at a funeral. He was standing in the pulpit and he was getting ready to, to uh, start his sermon, and his phone rang, and he said, Silence and put it back in his pocket. Went on back to his to his sermon, and about two minutes later, it rang again. And he said, "I'm so sorry. Excuse me." And about two minutes later, as you might expect, it rang a third time. He went, "Excuse me." Pulled it out of his pocket, flung it across the room, and broke it about ten pieces on the wall. And he said, "Now we won't bother us anymore." <laughs> I have found that in the funeral industry, anything in the world can happen. I only thought it happened in places that it happens in that business as well. 2006, in Colorado, there was a young fellow who came up to the youth on a mission training facility. 
three days before Christmas. The uh, training camp had just finished having their company Christmas party. There was about a foot and a half of snow on the ground. And he went up and he asked for logging. Now he wasn't a stranger to this, this, uh, this group, for he had been employed there at one time and they had discharged him because they recognized he had mental problems. And so when he met with the director and two others in the, in the roadway, they told him that we can't help you tonight. Sorry that we can't, but you need to move on. And he assured them that it was no problem to pull out a gun and kill three of them. And he walked away in the snow. Nobody knew any better. Twelve hours later, he showed up some hundred miles away at a very large church. Armed, as we would say in the business, armed with the teeth. Hundreds and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. Hand carried bomb, handmade bombs that he was bringing with him, just to create a distraction. And he entered the lobby of this very large facility with the sole purpose in mind to see how many people he could kill. And when he entered the lobby, he began engaging people and he began shooting. And you can imagine the chaos and the utter panic that took over in this church. One off-duty sheriff's head was part of their security team. And she came running across to engage the shooter. She ran across a very large uh, foyer, if you will, vestibule, if you will, and engaged this man in a gun battle. She did shoot him, didn't kill him. And just like we would figure it would happen, he took the chickens away out and killed himself. Multiple people had been shot. Several had been killed. It didn't seem like it was too much longer after that until another fellow walked into a church that was engaged in their worship service. Pastors in the pulpit speak. And the young man walked down the aisle, walked up to the preacher. The preacher holding his Bible in his hand, asking what he could do for it. He shot the preacher through the Bible and killed him in the morning. Would you use the mic, please? Okay, let's see if we can get them to turn it up. Oh. We got it on. <coughs> got it up? Okay, we'll see if we can do better with that. Okay. Okay. The, uh, the point being is that there was no telling when this was going to come. There was no warning about either one of these situations. They didn't expect it to come, but it did. Ben and I sat out and talked about this, and I said, you know, we've got to do something to try to help our churches, help us to be able to plan, help us to be able to prevent things from happening in our churches before it ever takes place. Now, as, as Ben said, I'm a, I'm a Baptist preacher, and I love doing what I do, but I also realize that I'm limited to what I'm able to do in myself. So I began to search, and I found Acts 20, 28 speaks specifically to those of us who are leaders within our church. Now today, you're going to hear me use terms such as church or worship center. You're going to hear me use terms such as church leaders or pastors. All of this is synonymous because it doesn't matter in this environment. It doesn't matter if we're talking about a church or a synagogue. It doesn't matter if we're talking about a community center or an industrial center. We're talking about safety and keeping the people in our community safe. Right. Acts 20:28 20, says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. I felt like that verse spoke to me. I felt like that we as church leaders and people within our community as leaders, that we have a responsibility. And you obviously feel the same way or you wouldn't be here tonight. Now, I am not going to tell you that this is going to be a, a, a one-time, one, one shot, uh, makes it all better and it'll all go away after just, just attending here. This has got to be very generic. 
Everybody look at the person who's sitting to your left. Look at the one who's sitting to your right. Every one of these people are different than you. Every one of them have different needs than you. There are several of you in here that I've known for many, many years, and I can assure you your needs are different than my needs. And it's the same way with whatever church it is that you represent. Your needs for your own particular facility are different than they are for the next person's needs. So this cannot possibly be a, a situation where we can, we can talk and we can train and we can discuss and give you everything that you're going to need tonight. What this is going, what this is designed to give you tonight is the opportunity to be able to start thinking about this process to let you know what resources are there for you and to help you get this process started. I'm going to take about 30 minutes of your time. Your time is valuable and I don't want to, I don't want to take up too much of your time tonight. But I do want to least give us some kind of a background here so that we can understand our position. I, I wanted to look and see what we've got to do in this world, in this day and age, to say, stay safe. What do we have to do? Well, this one says that we need to avoid riding in automobiles because 20% of all fatalities happen in car crashes. Can't stay in our own home because 17% of all accidents occur in the home. We need to avoid at all costs walking on the streets or on the sidewalks because 14% of all accidents involve pedestrians. Can't travel by air or rail or water because 16% of all those accidents happen in those forms of transportation. And of the remaining 33%, 32% of those people die in hospitals. So by all means, don't go to the hospital. <laughs> but you will be pleased to know that only one one thousandth of all deaths occur in worship services in the church. And these are usually related to one of those previous conditions that we talked about. <laughs> and you'll be happy to know that even fewer accidents happen to those and deaths that happen to those that are in Bible study. So by all means, you want to be sure that the one place that you are is studying the Bible in your church. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I had to do that. I couldn't pass that. Why should we be concerned? Why is this important? How many have not heard about what happened in Charleston a few weeks ago? See, every one of us have. We've been bombarded with this through the media. They made sure that we got to hear about this. But I'm going to challenge you. How many of us uh, play around on the internet? How many of us have access to it? I'm going to challenge you. Whenever you leave out of here, I want, to, I want to challenge you to go and look up church-related violence. And you're going to find a host of events that happened all across our country that you never even knew took place. Mm -hmm. Things that happened that you weren't even aware of. Pastors and churches are oftentimes considered controversial. Of the pastors that I know, I don't know too many of them that are shy. <laughs> And they will tell you the way that they see it. Even if you don't like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Many churches have services that are televised. That's become more and more and more. So they've got a ready access to it. Churches typically have very little security on site. Typically. They collect money. And I will assure you that if you're in a Southern Baptist church, I can almost guarantee you when you're going to be taking up your offering. Very few churches of any denomination have any kind of a plan in place to defend themselves. As leaders within our churches, we're, we are the ones who are really managing the panic that's going to come. As leaders and ones charged with having to manage that panic, it's going to be important that we have a plan, have things in place. When it comes down to the to the boogeyman, comes down to the bad guys here, they're going to obviously target a soft target, a whole lot more than one that's, that's prepared. Goes the same way with your house. 
Now, my wife and I moved to a new community about uh, four years ago. Now, I love my wife. Please understand me. And when, when this gets aired here in a few days, I want her to hear me say, I love you. Okay? I have been able to, uh, to keep this young lady around me now for 18 years. She possesses the two attributes I find most attractive. She's nearsighted and dull. So life is good. But my wife, married to the guy who was supposedly supposed to be the guy who knew about how to keep the property safe in Western North Carolina, decides that it would be appropriate to leave her pocketbook in our unlocked car. Well, it was in our carport, was her excuse. Well, ours was the first one that was hit. And apparently the pickings must have been good because they went around to the rest of the community and hit about six other cars. They looked for that soft target. We were the soft target because we left the car in the lot. Bad guys look for that. They look in your churches to see, okay, who looks like they're on the ball? Who looks like they've got something on, you know, planned and ready to go? All houses of worship have, a, have visible, predictable points and patterns. Churches are funny creatures. Mm -hmm. Heaven help us if we were to ever really change anything. <laughs> because people get they get they get their, their, their shirt collars all twisted up here. They don't much like it whenever we change things. So we do things on a predictable pattern, don't we? Most facilities rely exclusively on physical and procedural security. Most of them look at that exclusively. That's the only thing we're gonna have. We're not gonna consider good common sense. <laughs> We're not going to consider in here what it's going to take to change things up and make our predictability less predictable. No, we're going, to, we're going to set this pattern, we're going to set up a procedure, and we're going to stick with that no matter what. So why should we be concerned? The focus of most security is in the form of looking from the inside out. Now, I'm going to explain this so that it makes I hope, a little more sense. As churches, as ones who are, we are trained as ministers to look out into our community and to reach from the church outward, we are failing to think in the terms of the criminal who is looking from the outside in. Most of the focus of the security in churches is what can we do to protect ourselves from out here rather than saying, What's the bad guy looking at in me? You understand? You know, I want us to be able to think in that mindset to where it starts now. Oh, okay. What can I do that the bad, that's going to keep that bad guy from being able to come Faith-based personnel typically are not trained in awareness, threat recognition, or conflict resolution. When security and law enforcement or fire and EMS are called to interdict, I can promise you by that point it's too late. It's tough now to close the barn door after the cows got out, as my grandma used to say. Who's worshiping with you? This one's in Detroit, Michigan. The man opened fire with a shotgun during the church service on Sunday morning, killed a woman and wounded two other people before he shot himself a mile away. Took the chickens way out. August 1st of 06. This is the uh, preacher's wife. How many preachers are married? No, don't tell me that. I don't know. Okay. When you go home tonight, tell your spouse, I love you so much. Okay? Preacher's wife got upset over some text messages that he was allegedly sending to one of his youth people. She holds him hostage in his own church. February the 10th of 06 in Connecticut, contaminant that sickened 40 people at church is still a mystery. Headline in the paper. We can put this real, real quick. They're taking communion. It says here that the first 40 who drank out of the cups got sick. They poisoned them. Now, was that somebody from the outside? Probably not. Probably not. 
So what's our call? What are we supposed to be doing? <clears throat> We're called the shepherd. Amen. The shepherd, and, and, and I'm a city boy, please don't, don't, don't look bad on me. I don't know nothing about raising sheep, but I know what I'm being told. I know the sheep are supposed to be about the dumbest creatures God created. <coughs> sheep cannot lead themselves. They have to have a shepherd. Yeah. So as shepherds and as leaders of our church, we're called specifically to shepherd that flock. We have, As shepherds, we have specific duties and responsibilities within our church. The shepherd used tools that were, that were designed for his particular purpose. The staff and the rod, the two tools that he was typically used, had a particular purpose. And every shepherd knew how to use those tools. If you're a carpenter sitting out here, you know specifically what tool you need to have to perform a particular job. If you're a firefighter, you know what you've got to have to perform a particular function. It's the way that it is here when we're talking about shepherding. That's what we're trying to help us to come across tonight, is to help us to realize that shepherds were to use the tools that are given to them. Staff of the shepherd, they have many, many, many roles that they have to do. That staff is to provide aid and comfort. That staff provides protection. That staff provides power and defense and correction. It was used as a tool for climbing and traveling so that that shepherd could, could traverse the ground and have something that he could rely upon, a tool that he could use. The staff was the tool that that shepherd knew to use. What is crime prevention? Well, now, we, we weren't smart enough to come up with, with this on our own. I mean, we actually... Uh, we actually can't, excuse me, let me back that up. One more time. There we go. I got happy on the button. We actually came up with this one, and I thought it fit, it fit what crime prevention does. It's the anticipation, recognition, and appraisal of a crime risk in the initiation of some plan or action to remove or reduce that risk. That's what you're doing here tonight. You're initiating that action. You're recognizing that there is an issue that we need to be aware of. So we're going to take the steps that we got to to prevent that crime. So what is a crisis? It's a sudden and generally unanticipated event that profoundly and negatively affects a significant segment of the campus population and often involves serious injury. I've done uh, security risk assessments for probably 25 churches within our county. And we've looked at what could be. We've looked at what has been noted on their properties. What dangers do we see that's so readily accessible? What can we do to help you reduce your risk? What can we do to help you prevent becoming in this crisis? And of those, every church has got problems. Every one of them. Emergency Action Plan. This is one of the things that you're going to be seeing us talk about here tonight and what the basis of this whole thing is. You know, I'm not real, real uh, happy about the way that some things go in churches. And I'm especially not real, real happy about with, uh, you know, the way the government sometimes will interfere with our, with our life as ch in churches. But there are some times when it actually makes for some good sense. Church we have to realize is a business. There's no other way to look at it. Church is a business. And as such, we are required by federal law to have an emergency action plan. So what is an emergency action plan? It's a written directive issued by the church leaders, by the church leaders that coordinates their actions before, during, and after incident occurs. It's not something that I come up with that tells you what you have to do. It's what you come up with that fits your particular congregation. Remember that person I told you to look at on your left and on your right? Your needs are not their needs. And their needs are not your needs. You need to have something that's going to work for your congregation. That's what's most important. 
The effective plant not only looks at the incidence but of, the, of the physical plant, but it also looks at the overall operation of the church and addresses its specific needs. We can make available to you at the end of this a model policy. A place for you to at least start. Give you some place that you can, you know, latch my feet on so it kind of makes some sense to you. But if, if, and there's not, but if there was a policy in there dealing with safety around swimming pools, and you don't have a swimming pool, you don't need that policy, right? right. Rip it out of the book, you don't need it. It doesn't apply to that's what I love about doing this is because we can make it specific to your needs. The United States Department of Labor, Occupational Safety, Health and Administration states almost every business is required to have an emergency action plan. So they said we've got to come up with a measurement. We've got to come up with a way for, for us to determine who has to have a plan and who doesn't. How many of our churches that are represented here tonight have fire extinguishers? I would say that would probably represent just about everybody, wouldn't it? How many of us are going to require the people in our church, if a fire breaks out, to stay behind and fight the fire? None of us, are we? We're going to evacuate the building, right? Federal law says that if there is a fire and you are going to be evacuating the building, even though your building is required by fire code to have extinguishers there to fight the fire, you have to have an emergency action plan. How many of us knew that? There's a few. There's a few. So what should we consider when we're writing our PAB? Well, we need to think about our community. Think about the ones that we're here to serve. Those that we're actually trying to reach out and help from our, from our church standpoint. We need to think about them first. Think about the community that we're here to serve. Think about now, looking a little closer in, the church property as a whole. You might have a church that, that encompasses acres and acres and acres of, of uh, you know, pavement and buildings and people and vehicles and all kinds of stuff. You might have a swimming pool for all I know. Or you may have a small church that would fit inside this room. Every one of them needs to be looking at your property as a whole. The process and the procedure itself, whatever it is, no matter what it is, it's got to make sense and it's got to work for y'all. If you can't say through your process, what do I do if this happens? Then your policy is nothing but a bunch of words on the page. It needs to look at the building itself it needs to look at what the church's response is to incidents. If that incident comes, if it happens, you need to have a response in mind. It also then needs to look at the people that are within your church. How many of us have uh, have babies, bed babies, in our church? Yeah. How about uh, senior adults that are not quite as mobile as they used to be? Yeah. Those are two classes, very extreme classes of people within our church that require special attention. If you have a disaster happen within your church, you need to be able to get both of those people out of there. Yeah. They can't help themselves, they have to rely on you. We talked about examining from the outside in. We wanted you to, to be aware that you need to be looking at your sidewalks. You would be so surprised at how many sidewalks Folks, I wouldn't know it was even there. I mean, uh, there's some of them I've seen more cars parked on than, uh, than pedestrians walking on. There have been some that have been in such disrepair that uh, the grass is about taking them over. But we need to be aware of looking at, at our pedestrian areas. The signage within our church, not just the one out front that says, you know, the first whatever church or whoever called me here, church. But the signage that's within there that tells people how to get to where they need to go. <coughs> Thinking of it as that visitor who's the first time that I've ever pulled up at this church. I want, I want them to know where they're supposed to go. Right here. 
Breeders and on-site security. And finally, most all of us who were who were in this this business will tell you that that's your first line of defense. If you've got an effective greeter program, somebody who's out there helping folks park their cars, somebody who's coming up and saying, "Hey, how you doing, brother? Boy, it's good to see. You. Come on, let me help you into a Sunday school class." Chances of that person feeling like they're safe is much greater now. They're your first line. They can be your best friend. Right. Having an effective greeter program carries you a long way. Lighting, uh, being around the churches at night. I've had some that I really wish I had me a pair of those, those glasses that had the lights on them. You know, so I could see my way. It gets a little spooky sometimes. I don't mind telling you. Controlled access, both vehicular and pedestrian. Now this one just kind of bugs me. I have, a, I have a bit of a problem on how we're supposed to get people from their vehicles to the building and from the building back to their vehicles if we're not taking some kind of control with how we're going to move them. Because I promise you, there will be some little grandma who probably shouldn't be driving at 108. <laughs> but she's going to go to church no matter what. And somebody is going to be gacking about what they're going to be having for lunch today, and they're going to step out in front of Grandma. Oops. You know, we need to be thinking about things like this. What kind of control access can we have for those pedestrians and vehicles? An automobile alarm is always a good plan. You know, burglars, criminals are just exactly like cockroaches. Ever think about that? They're just like cockroaches. They, they got a few things that they don't like. They do not like light. You know? You ever walked in? Oh, God forbid. You ever walked in you, you, in your kitchen in the middle of the night to go get a, get a glass of milk? Flipped on that light switch? Woo! My wife, who I love dear, <laughs> she don't do no bugs. Let me tell you. Cockroaches don't like light. Neither do criminals. Criminals don't like the light because they don't want to be seen. They also don't like noise. They don't want to be, they want to be worn off. And that's where an audible alarm and effective lighting on your property pays off. Might not make real good friends with your neighbors. Your church neighbors may not care a whole lot for you. But you're not going to get your building broken too nearly as much if you're prepared. The view of the building itself. Ben and I did a, uh, did a security risk assessment that had it not have been known by the sign out front of the building that it was a church, you'd have never known it because the vegetation had grown up so bad you couldn't see the steeple. Let's, let's let people know what we are and who we are. Okay. So the view of the building itself. Landscaping and vegetation and hardscape, those things all come into play on this. All those things that we need to be thinking about and looking at. Examining the outside of the building again. AC units that are in our windows or under our windows. I did a uh, risk assessment at a church not too long back that uh, they, like many churches, had window air conditioning units. Now there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of churches do. But they didn't have them secured into the window in any fashion at all. And what had been used as filler strip beside, you know, the window and the air conditioner was that little blue foam core board that you buy at the craft store. I don't know about you, but it's not real difficult to be able to punch that stuff out and get in your building. Right? Unsecured items. I arrested the guy one time that I, I had been looking on for a bunch of residential burglaries, and this just kind of ties into the same, same mindset. He was always doing second floor burglaries. He'd never go in the ground level. He said that was only, it only made perfect sense because that's where most people have an alarm. They don't alarm the upper floors. Most of the time they got the doors and windows locked on that first level, but they don't think about it on the second level. And as my investigation kept going on, 
and I finally got to zero it in and really work in the neighborhood and talk to the folks, what did you see that was unusual? Now, I'm going to tell you who the first person is as an investigator. Prove me out. First person you go see as an investigator is go find the nosiest neighbor you got. <laughs> yeah. Nosy neighbor. Wonderful. You're a cop's best friend. So I go to, who's your nosiest neighbor? Well, Miss So-and-so down the street. So I go to Miss So-and-so's house, and she said, well, you know, honey, now that I think about it, I did see a guy carrying a ladder down the street the other day, and I thought that's a little odd. <laughs> and you know, we probably would not have gotten this guy, but he got in the second floor bedroom window. Things were working really well. He was so pleased with himself. Neighbors didn't, didn't raise the ruckus. In fact, the dog in the house didn't raise a ruckus <laughs> until he got in. And he didn't raise a ruckus until the dog bit him. <laughs> you don't get away from a German Shepherd that easy. No. Unsecured items. I get the bad guy. Where'd you get the ladder? Carried it from three doors down the street. Unsecured items. A burglar doesn't need to carry tools if you're leaving them out for them. Okay? Hiding places. If you close your eyes right now and you sit and you think about your building, you think about your property, how many hiding places do you have? Make you stop and think. Security devices on your windows and doors. Are your doors master key? We, we can talk about this as we go into doing an assessment at your property. But uh, true life story, we had a guy who uh, went into the health department, took hostages, barricaded himself in the building. What do we do as police officers? We call in the SWAT team. What does SWAT team do? Their whole focus is get the bad guy. Get the bad guy, get the bad guy. Health department said, we're going to evacuate the building. We're going to get all of our folks out of there. Their process and their procedure had taught their employees, when you leave, you close and lock your door. The SWAT team breached oh, every door in that building. In other words, they kicked every door in there. How much do we think that cost the taxpayers? Because the health department didn't have master keys. A simple little $20 piece <coughs> would have taken care of all this. But instead, it cost them thousands of dollars. Are your doors master keys? Any valuable items secured when they're not in use? Lighting, a box box is a box that I guarantee you, you've seen them before. There are a box that's mounted to the outside of the building, got a specific key fit. That key will only work within that fire district. It's actually the firefighters are the ones who can get you into that Knox box. All that spells called fire department. I always like firefighters. They don't go over that box. An alarm system, panic bars on all your evacuation doors. If if there's a problem at your building, I'd much rather people be able to get out, even if it includes the bad guy, than to have good people left locked in your building. Panic bars, that's, a, that's an easy fix. Exposed door hinges. If you think about your church, which way do your front doors swing? Do they swing out of the building or into the building? Out of the building, don't they? Most all churches do. Where's the hinge pins? On the outside. I had a guy that we arrested one time who said, you know, you never you never saw any damage to anything. He said, uh huh. I carried a punch and I carried a little bitty tack hammer. And I'd go up there and I'd just pick the hinge pins out and I'd lift the door out of the frame and I'd be in. Nobody said criminals and cockroaches are stupid. You know, cockroaches have lived for thousands and thousands of years. First aid kits within your building. Fire escape plans and evacuation routes. Again, that goes right back into what we're talking about with your emergency action plan and talking about what your fire department would really want you to be able to have. And fire extinguishers, having those readily available. 
processing your procedure. What do we do in the event of? If you're going to write your policy, if you're going to write your procedure, please write that from the, from the standpoint of what are we going to do if. What are we going to do if there's an assault that happens here at the church? Or if there's a bodily fluid spill? Now, my mom, I love my mom almost as much as I love my wife. Don't tell my mom I said that. Taught the two-year-old kids Sunday school class for 48 years. I think she's got a little shoe left in this. But I guarantee you there's been more than one occasion when little Susie or little Johnny has come in that they've thrown up that she said, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. And she's got a lot of paper towels and she's cleaned them up and she's thrown it in the trash can and she's washed her hands and she's went on about her business and Monday morning the janitor's come in not knowing any different. And he's had to clean this up now. If you've got a contagious disease that is being spread. Now who she infected? I love my mama, but my mama messed up. Has your, has your church made a plan for that? Have you thought about that? Bomb threats and suspicious packages, burglaries, larcenies, child abuse. Folks, child I do foster care. I can tell you that right now in Bowman County, at any given time, there are more than 300 children that are in foster care. In our county, people, that's appalling to me. You know, it bothers me greatly that we have that many children in foster care. That in the United States, there are more, almost a half a million children that are in foster care. I would venture a guess, and I don't have any way to back this up, but just go excuse me, old street experience, I would venture a guess that we're seeing one third of the kids that need to be in foster care are actually there. So if we're looking at a half a million children that are in foster care now, potentially there could be one and a half million people there because of various abuses that take place in these children's lives. It bothers me when we see those two ends of the spectrum the old, the elderly, and the children that are being victimized. It bothers me when we see that. What has your church got set up to deal with child abuse? What have they set up for severe weather? You know, I don't remember being a being a, a guy who was born and raised here. I don't remember too many tornadoes that hit here until the last few years. And I've been seeing a few. Kind of concerns me because a lot of the churches don't have them. Have we set up a disaster response kit? What are we going to do in the event of a disorderly conduct, emergency contact list? Have you got a contact list for the people in your church? Who's got it? Where is it? God forbid if, if lightning struck your building, which we had one uh, hit Meadowbrook back it's not too many months back. Hit just below the steeple, did some $50,000 worth of damage to the building. If it had happened that that building had burned down, where do you think that the records are for that church? What are we going to do in the event of foreign substance or poisons? You know, and it, and it goes on and on and on. You know, we can, we can see all kinds of situations that come that we need to have a handle on. A pastor in the church in the urban community called me. He said, we had a guy showed up in our Sunday school classroom. Didn't really do anything, except he decided that he was going to lay down on the chairs, the, the row of chairs, and just see what kind of disturbance he could cause. Well, he caused the disturbance in that classroom, but now it's a bigger disturbance because a church that is not prepared to deal with this has got to go deal with it. You know? So, so thinking about those things, if you have to, if you have an active shooter, for instance, on your property, have you got a lockdown procedure in place? You know, have you got some kind of media communication? If something happens on your property, who's the news media going to go see? Oops, say that again. The pastor. <laughs> Guys, I don't want to be sitting in your shoes. 
Because everybody in the world is going to be dependent on you. How thin can you be spread? Church members are going to be looking at you. Your deacon boys are going to be looking at you. Your other servants are going to be looking at you. Your grandma, who's 108 years old, can't get her car out of the parking lot, is going to be looking at you. Everybody's going to be looking at the pastor. The pastor needs help. Somebody, please say that. Preacher needs help. An emergency response kit contains the documents and the items that will aid the team and the other church leaders in the crisis situation. There's got to be a plan in place to where you're saying, oh, okay, well, yeah, this kind of makes sense now. Yeah, uh, hmm, I hadn't thought about it. Yeah, we're in this situation. We've got a donkey that's coming into the fellowship hall and seeking up all the roses that's on the table. Never had to deal with that before. How many kits do you need? We always want to tell you to get at least two. One to be stored on site and one to be stored away from. I hate to fly. I really do. A guy as fat as me is not supposed to be able to fly. It's just not natural. My father was a firefighter. Spent 36 years. I was so proud of my dad. I loved running along with my dad in the fires and the trained and volunteer firemen. That was the coolest thing to grow up. When I was 12 years old, my dad became the training officer for the City of Asheville Fire Department. And he'd come home and he'd say, hey, come out here and watch this. We'd get the chemicals together and watch stuff blow. I had the coolest childhood. But you know, I figured out something along the way. Two laws you can never, ever, ever get away from. Gravity and physics. You see, it is possible with bad guys shooting at you, they might hit you and they might not. 50 50. It's a gamble. But if you're on the roof of a house, the laws of gravity are 100%. You will hit the ground. It goes back to the law of physics fat guys don't bounce. Okay? That's why I was not a firefighter. I learned a long time ago that if you're going to do this kind of thing, if you're going to put kits together, you need to have it in two places. Don't have it in one, have it in two. Kits should be stored in a planned, available location within the building. If you have something that happens, do you have a structure set up where you can say, okay, you know this is your job and this is what you're supposed to go and do. This is the person that we're supposed to be turning to. Pastor, you don't need to be the one. You don't need anything. A master kit stored in a secured off-site location such as the parsonage and other locations where it can be easily uh, accessed. If you have a total loss of your facility, if a fire goes through there and burns your facility down, it's going to be important that you would have your insurance information. It's going to be important that you have your church role so that you can get in touch with folks and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. This is what we've run across. It's going to be important that you have a location set up where you can do business for a short period of time. Having two-way radios in there, having uh, keys to all your doors. I mean, my goodness, if you've got a ring of keys, it looks like it ought to be in that belonging to a locksmith. I guess that's just what they'll have to deal with. But master keys sure do keep the process simple. Make it awfully easy. And no, I don't do locksmith, so I can't. Blueprints and floor diagrams, and uh, if, I, if I can say, and I don't know that I can say this wholeheartedly for every fire district in our county, but I think that I can. You can go through your fire departments. Most of them have got it mapped out. They know your building. They probably already got it pre-programmed for them. I know several of the districts do. So that'd be a place for you to start for where you can get diagrams for your building. Clergy and a staff roster. List of the available emergency team members and individual duties and what their what their duties are so that everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. Those little small items that you wouldn't think a whole lot of, such as reflective vests that say, this is the guy you want to talk to if you're in the media. This is the one that's that's in charge from the church. This is the one that does this task, and this is the one that does that task. 
those are all important things. Disposable cameras are going to come in handy for you if you're having to, to uh, document any of the damages that have come. Photos of all the church members in the current church directory. How, how, uh, how often do we do church directories? Every year. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I know a lot of them that I, I walked into churches asking for the church directory and it was one ahead from 1969. <laughs> you know? List of their members who have special needs. Those people who are who have dementia, it, it's going to be important that you be able to identify those people and be, able to be there to help them. A utility turnoff procedure. If you've got natural gas in your building, I'm sure the firefighters would probably love it if you cut the gas off before the fire trucks hit there. They'd probably be really grateful for that. How do we get started? Identifying a person within your congregation that has expertise. Let me assure you that the number one person in your church that has the expertise of knowing your building is your custodian. Your custodian knows that building inside and out. Every nook and cranny can tell you if there's a spider web in this corner. They know that building. Rely on that person. Put them on that team. They're going to help you. Contact your local law enforcement. Ask them to do a security risk assessment. You know what? Hey, Ben, how much do you charge for a security risk assessment? I'm seeing a goose egg. They don't charge for that here. They don't charge for that in this country. Yeah, in a sense you have. So it doesn't cost you anything, just a little bit of your time. And these guys are more than happy to help you with this. Contact your local fire department and the emergency management office to ask for their assistance. They, are a, they have a wealth of information that they can give you. Do a walkthrough of your property. You know, put on your bad guy cap and say, okay, I'm the bad guy here. What could I do if I got into this one? How could I get in the easiest? What's the place that I could get into that I know I wouldn't be seen? Contact the other churches and request a copy of their policy. You'll be surprised at the other churches. They love to help churches out. I'm not all about reinventing the wheel. I mean, really. If you can plagiarize, I would, I'd be glad to give credit to the John Brown Baptist Assembly and First Heavenly Days God ordained the church of the Second Resurrection. I don't care what it says on there. I'll give them all kinds of credit. Utilize what they've already done. See if it doesn't help you. When the policy's been developed, conduct tabletop exercises. This is where guys like Ben can come in and be handy for you. He'd be glad to come in and help your, your, your emergency team be able to conduct these kind of tabletop exercises. These, oh, okay, now this is the, this is the make believe. What are we going to do if X, Y, and Z happens? They can come in and can help you pull that off and help you do that. Schedule a, an annual policy review and make the updates as, as needed. You know, I said this a little bit earlier, but I'm going to stress it again. If you have a policy that you don't practice, if you have a policy that you don't review and update and keep up, it's nothing more than a bunch of gibberish written down on paper. It does you no good. If you had to pull your driver's license out of your pocket right now and, and with your eyes closed say what color hair you had when that driver license was made, some of us don't have much of a problem with that. But there are some others that I guarantee you ain't got to what's designated down there. You know? In a crisis, church leaders manage panic. Any plan that is not practiced is nothing more than a bunch of words on a page. You're not in this process alone. You are not fighting this big, big ugly, hairy monster by yourself. Every one of us that are sitting here in this room have got to cross this threshold. We have to be aware. We need to utilize our resources, use, use our law enforcement, firefighters, and emergency personnel. Do, uh, do any of us not have nurses or uh, engineers or cops or firefighters? Do we not have any of those kind of people within our churches? I mean, every, about every church has it. Utilize those people. Put them on this team. Talk them into it. 
Three weeks ago, I'm at my house. I'm minding my own little business. My buddy Ben calls me up. Hey, man, I take you to lunch? Sure. I'd love to go to lunch with you. We get out at the restaurant, and we sit down, and we're midway through our meal, and he's in one out. Man, I didn't want to make this business lunch, but... And here we are. He utilized the resources. You know, lots of resources within your church. <coughs> Quit that. Your church can be a haven or it can be a death trap. Now, I know that sounds awful dramatic. We, as church leaders, we have a very specific responsibility when it comes down to the safety and security of people in our churches. It doesn't matter if you're the pastor, if you're the head of the group, or you're the custodian. You have a responsibility. This is not an end all be all kind of meeting. This meeting, as I said, was designed to do nothing more than just spark hands. Before you start thinking a little bit about this, I am not an expert on this. Did anybody know what the, what the definition of an expert is? Expert is actually a compound phrase. X means something that's former or past or old. And a spurt is a grip under pressure. Well, I'm not an expert either, okay? But I figure between those of us that are in here, we can probably collaborate here and come up with an answer. We'll be happy to answer your questions if we can. But I'm going to tell you, we ain't going to know all of be all. We can't fit everything for you here tonight. Ben, they're going to come around. It's going to help a bunch if we can let them bring a mic to you. Anybody have a question? No, we got one over here, Stan. Oh, you go ahead. Perfect. Oh, yes. Our organization is very light on staff. Lots of volunteers do work. Cramming for some of the members to go out. So, how do you suggest handling the needs of a security team with all the requirements of knowledge and procedures when you don't have them there all the time? My suggestion, if I, was, if I was in that position, I would think of it the same way that I would think about how am I going to get somebody to teach the three-year-old Sunday school class. It's going to have to be somebody that I can count on. And it's going to have to be somebody that's at least got enough tolerance to put up with me. I would look at it from how are you going to recruit for anything else that you're going to be doing within your, within your organization. You know, if I'm, if I'm looking to build you know, an extension onto the stage, I'm going to want to go to whoever my partner is that's there and say, can I take you to lunch? <laughs> Work for me. Is, is there a legality issue if you want to ask people to, that have concealed carry uh, or ask people to volunteer that they are concealed carry. Is there a legality issue about that? Ben, you you did the research on this, and I'm only I'm going to defer to you. Right, and uh, we have a uh, copy of the North Carolina General Statute right down there on the podium um, that was from the uh, correct me from the UNC Law Group, and they provided a lot of information for us. So it's an available online. Concealed carry, you have to follow your state's law. Okay. And um, your bylaws are nothing more than policy, okay? So you need to refer to your policies. Um, but now, as far as asking and, or making those people identifiable who have concealed carry, I don't see if there's a problem in asking them, okay? Um, but it's, a, it's probably a good idea to know who those people are to, you know, to be able to utilize those uh, folks in the church or whatever. Uh, wherever you may be. Some people don't have like a church building. You also have to uh, kind of defer to those people. Like, I've got a group uh, contacted me 
earlier on uh, in the week, they don't meet. The, the place that they meet is actually county property. Well, you know, that's posted. You can't carry firearms on that if it's posted by a private or federal or county entity. So you have to refer to those law and policy. Does that answer your question? Thank you for our awesome presentation. There were too many notes to copy. Do you have an exportable PowerPoint presentation that we can take away with us or come and get? Without robbing the internet. Yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we do, and I've made that available to Ben. He also has this, this same program that I've done here tonight. I'm more than happy to that. So we're going to make that available as well. Uh, we, we were going to print those off. And uh, county budget, uh, as you know, uh, it was going to be about seven to eight pages for each packet. We were looking over 2,000 and some odd pieces of paper. Uh, so we thought, well, maybe we can do it double sided. So, yeah, you know, we wanted to save it. But we will make that link available as well. Got a question up here. I wanted to piggyback off the concealed carry your own question. Our church is surrounded by three homeless shelters. We have a lot of them bringing book bags in. Um, and don't know what, you know exactly, any of them they very well can have a, a weapon of some sort in it. Can we ask them by law to leave them, you know, in a certain area instead of carrying them to the sanctuary, or is that against the law? No, it's not. Uh, churches, even though we are a, we're a public access uh, facility, it is still private property. So you can still say, no, you need to leave your book bags here. You know, it's, it's a private property under a rights kind of situation. So yes, we can actually restrict or to allow them to do it one time. I was not that good of a speaker, I know. <laughs> so, uh, good presentation. Um, a man walks in the back of our chapel with a pistol. What do you recommend? <laughs> Duff, Duff, uh, first thing's got to be self preservation. You've got to get, you got to get the bad guy there. Bill, I'm going to defer to you. I like utilizing my resources. This an active shooter comes in comes in the building, what are you gonna do? You know, there's no way to answer the question. There's no way to answer that question in a in a form like this. Active shooter in and of itself is such a huge scary monster. Um, I would say that in your packet there, there is a uh, sheet of paper that talks about a, a church security seminar that uh, several entities are going to be doing, August 15th, for Trinity Baptist Church. Uh, that seminar is going to have a number of law enforcement uh, sheriffs are going to speak, uh, chiefs will be speaking, uh, there will be several folks there teaching uh, you how to start teams how to uh, finance teams, how to train particularly teams. Steve's right, you know, without a team in place, without a trained group of individuals <coughs> whose primary focus it is to uh, nullify a threat such as an act of self-preservation has to be uh, the one and only concern. There are ways to deal with that. That's not outside the realm of the possibility for anyone in there. Uh, there are teams in Asheville, North Carolina, that are armed. There are teams, and these teams are, are trained and practice regularly to deal with active shooters, as well as sanctuary disruption, shoot extraction, and other emergencies on the property. So all of these things are within your reach. It's just that's not, that's not easy to answer in a simple question and answer session like this. I'll be glad to stick around and talk to you a little bit later about uh, who I am or who my organization is, uh, but I would encourage you to look at the uh, seminar there that you've got and uh, think about maybe attending that if in fact you want to learn how to actually put a team together and train it and, and get up and run. 
Bill, real quick. Um, Bill, is that just available to pastors or is that anyone? Any, but it, the, the letters are going out to churches, to pastors, uh, but anyone can attend. It is a fee event. There is a charge for it. It's at uh, Trinity Baptist Church, which is at 216 Shelburne Road in West Asheville. It will be on Saturday, August the 15th from 9 a.m. until about 4 or 5 or whenever we get done. We, and yes, we will actually have a team there that will be doing presentations on dignitary protection, uh, sanctuary disruptions, active shooter, use of force, um, and we'll get into a lot of the legalities as well as the tactical operations and plan. Thank you, Bill. There are a lot of legal ways <laughs> we as churches have to look at, look at situations and have to decide if they're going to leave it in our own body as to what we want to do. Hey, Steve, I, what I'd like to do is uh, being on the bylaws committee and rewriting for the last two years, we need to talk about my building. We talk about the backpack. You ask them to leave them somewhere, and all of a sudden they're missing $500 or whatever. So you need to check your policy and what you're willing to, uh, to risk and not risk. Exactly right. That is something that has to be concerned about. So that would be a lot of the church. That's right. That's right. Yes, right. I think it's this has been a wonderful uh, conference, and I'm, I'm certainly appreciative to you. But uh, also, I would like to say that on the same day, August the 15th, at, um, on Saturday, at the Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, the Baptist Ministers Union is also sponsoring um, how you know to keep our churches safe. So it's great that. This is going around in the community that everybody is concerned about this problem. And so I would just also like to say that um, even though Trinity is having this great, hope everybody have a successful time, but we also plan to have a successful time with the Baptist Ministers Union at the Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, which will be the time. 9 to 12. 9 to 12 o'clock at the same time. No job. No job. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've got some folks asking your address. Where I've got some folks asking your address. So where's that at? Forty seven Eagle Street in the historic part of Asheville. Forty seven Eagle Street. I got these folks right here doing front of the just keep your hand up, we'll, we'll get to you as, as we can. Oh, yeah. I'll thank you for your presentation. I'd like to ask a question, continuing with the, the backpack theme there. Uh, since it is a liability for the churches as far as requiring them to leave it in this uh, designated location, yeah. uh, what are the legalities as far as asking them to open the, the backpack? Uh, not necessarily searching it yourself, but asking them to open it and let you see inside make sure there's no way I think that I think that extends yeah I think it goes beyond the scope of the church. That's my personal opinion and I think that you find most of the attorneys would, would figure that's a that's an invasion of that person's privacy. So you're a whole lot better off by saying <coughs> leave them here or carry them out in your car or whatever. Okay. I think you're a lot better off. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, in the uh, news in the last couple of years, uh, our news report involved a person that has mental problems and involved a location that is called a gun free zone. You did not mention any of those words in the presentation. Can you say something now? <laughs> well, that's going to be what, what is allowed on the church's property is up to the church. It's up to them to decide whether they want to allow this or not. If you, and that's the reason why I started out saying that this is not just something for churches or for synagogues or for whatever. It, it fits in the industrial situation as much as any. If you're the property owner or the person who's in physical control, then you have the right to say what's allowed on that property and what's not. Uh, you know, it just it, it makes sense to me just to leave it with that property. Now, as far as mental instability, yeah, that seems to be a, a common key that's hidden. 
Can we can we possibly have a crystal ball and look into the into that crystal ball as leaders within our church and say who does and who doesn't? No way. It's not it's not possible. But what is possible is for us to get set up and have things ready and that we have that comes. Thank you. Uh, to that question about people with uh, concealed permits, our church has put in our operations manual that no weapons may be on church property except it's approved by the security team. So that kind of discusses, you know, ad or addresses, you know, who's going to have weapons. Does your, does your church have an attorney? <laughs> yeah, but uh, so, but anyway, my, no reason for my question on that. If you if you have an attorney who represents your church, I would strongly suggest you run this by him. Okay. So that it makes sure that the, that the church is not trying to get past something that some lawyer would know that a street cop just didn't want to be aware of when he preached. I don't want a guy to be wrong on that. Sure. Hey, Ben, we have someone in there. Great, great presentation, elected to Del Mar Buckham County, um, church affiliation, St. James A and B, 44 Hill and Bread, Pastor Brenda Prince Edward. My comment would be um, at the training session, are you guys going to have mental health officiants or people that are qualified? to work hand in hand with law enforcement. I'm a mother of two autistic children, and thank God I've been spared quite a bit. I've been spared a lot. No medication, my son is uh, doing well. He's going to get his bachelor's degree at UNCF <coughs> and prison here is working as well. But I'm finding in the mental health arena that Take care, a lot of times they're just looking for help. They're being put out on the street because of cutbacks. And, you know, sometimes maybe backpacks or things like that are their only possession. They're coming to church and looking for assistance and they don't quite understand. There is a difference. Um, just, just commenting, you know, that would be Smoky um, Ridge that's up there by St. Joseph. I would like to have that implemented, you know, because it is a difference. We have a story in our church, in our uh, neighborhood. I live beside a pastor and his wife, and they had a nephew. And this young man was clearly mentally unbalanced. He just, we watched this play out, this was like last month. He clearly could not get the assistance that he needed. So they put him out on Patton Avenue, right down here at the homeless shelter, and he walked, what is it, Bob Zeppelin Road? just wandering in the street because he could not actually get that help. That, that, so this is a very serious situation that we have. And I was just making the comment that have you have, do you have the mental health uh, experts in place when you go to the church? There's not a whole lot we can do. There's not not so much, but I, I just wanted to see if that was in place. And reflecting on what you're saying, I also have a 17-year-old who has Asperger's syndrome. Right. And dealing with that as well. So I, I, can, I can fully relate to what you're talking about. You know, it is a component right. that would that would be beneficial right. for anyone who's teaching this or anyone who's who's uh, trying to put together a policy for the right. church. Right. But keep in mind. Right. So yeah, I can understand exactly what you're saying. We're, you know, when we started into into autism in my house uh, 12 years ago. It was only little boys that got it. Little girls didn't get it. And there was only one in like 300 and some odd that ever got it. And now we're down to one in... It's in the 60s now. Yeah. So we're seeing... We're either, we're either discovering it a lot better, which I personally think is what it is. We're, we're, we're finding it a lot easier now. But now we're having to come up with a way to be able to deal with this as a society. And that, same way with churches. So I was just saying that similar, y'all don't have those people in place, the mental health experts. I don't know if Bill has it his company. Uh, it's not something that we've addressed oh. on our end of it, but I don't know if Bill has it with his or not. So. 
at least on the thing. I would just refer to the sheet or the number or maybe give him a call. Well, we set forth about an hour and a half's time limit. You done good. I've had danced all of you. <laughs> five years ago. I'm here on my time. I'm not getting paid for this. I'm here because I'm a pastor. I'm here because I'm a leader within my church. I'm here because I have a little bit of expertise in working within that environment and knowing a little better about how churches function than the average street cop. It's my desire that each one of us focus from the outside, looking inward for our church, to be saved, and from the inside out to reach people for Jesus. Amen. That's my heart's desire. If we can be of any assistance to you in your church, please don't hesitate to call us. I will give you Ben Parker's telephone number in a flash. <laughs> In the meantime, if you have to show up at Gross Funeral Home sometime and you see me, please say hello. And if you're ever in need of a, an old four part harmony, so the gospel will be able to see you. Thank you again.